to our evening worship service. Trust you've had a good day, relaxing day in the Lord, and you've come to worship with your cup right side up, and you've come with your heart open to the truth and ready to worship the Lord. Austin's going to come and lead us in a few songs. Good evening. Um, for our first song, we're going to start out with 281. 281. i 
for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. He stood up for us. Amen. We ought not be ashamed of him. We look to the Lord in prayer. Let's remember the uh, request from this morning. Let's continue to remember um, each one that's part of the family that lost her loved one this week, Viola. And um, each one of the family there, let's remember the Lashaway family is missing today. Uh, Mrs. Blackman, let's continue to remember her. And let's remember the nursing home and the people in there, Bucky's friends there. Let's continue to remember the outreach Thursday night, Bible study. The stumps as they come back this week so at some point, maybe towards the end of the week sometime. Friday they'll be back here. Let's remember them in prayer. And then we had some special and spokens that we wanted to mention. I'm sure others have others, but just some things are we can't always put out there, but God knows about them, and we just want to make mention of it. Let's continue to remember um, the existing requests. Most of us were here this morning. won't number them. Let's continue to remember Quint's family, especially his dad, as he gets back on his feet and as the cancer goes in backwards right now. Anything else new you want to mention or anything else we should add? Armando and Marsh is not here tonight. Okay. All right, if there's nothing else, let's stand together for a word of prayer. I'll ask my wife if she'll lead us in prayer tonight. This time will come to you for the evening offering. Janessa, sitting all by herself back there.
thank you for your giving and standing by. Continue to pray for the needs, financial and others. And also, I want to remember, um, oh, I just had his name, our friend from the Ranger School has been missing. Jordan, yes, haven't seen him for a few weeks, a week or so. So let's remember him in prayer. All right, this time we have a special number and song. testimony. I've gone too far. First step is too far to turn back. Amen. Once we taste of the good things of God, we realize what we've been missing and we've gone too far to turn back. Amen. Maybe somebody has a testimony on their heart tonight. There's just a few of us. Maybe you want to tell about God's goodness to you, what he's been doing in your life. Maybe a praise report. Amen. Thank you, 
Amen. All right, let's remember the announcements. Thursday night will be our Bible study at 6.30 and our children's club. Let's remember that. That'll be our first week in our new book. So if you don't have one, grab one and try and be here for that and have some thoughts and input. And then let's remember coming up this in about two weeks from now, we'll have so, uh, my daughter, Lord willing, be visiting with her friend, uh, Kyle. And there'll be another young man here. They'll be preaching for us. And uh, looking forward to that, Ricky Susan and Kyle Mar Markle and my daughter. So that'll be a more a special time there. The Stumps will be back next week. And let's look forward to that. And then coming up at the end of March... Um, the praise singers, the pamphlet is up. If you want to take a few of the flyers, if you know certain places you want to pin them up in the town, you're welcome to. That's Sunday, March 26th, the night service. The Heritage will be here, the Heritage Singers, they call it. Ryan Dickin, Regina Dickin, Mark Winkler, Ashley Plank, and Ethan McDonald. I think out of that, Regina... And Ashley was here last spring, possibly. Ashley was at least. Um, so the one, the one girl was here last spring. Um, the rest are new, and uh, let's remember that. And then our revival meeting will be the the weekend after that, going into the beginning of April. Looking forward to that with Brother Martin and the Maleys. Brother Martin's our conference president, and he has a heart for home missions, church planning, and he's a tremendous uh, soul winner, and God's given him ability to just knock on doors and work with people, and I specifically wanted him to come for that as someone to be around for a few days to mentor with. Looking forward to him uh, being here in the Maleys, and then we have some other things coming up. Like I mentioned this morning, we'll have the Lebanon Gospel Band here in June and some other things along the way we're looking forward to. It's supposed to be possibly some other young people coming up along the next few months, but we'll keep you posted as far as that goes. We've been working with the Stumps, um, before they left anyway, on getting a calendar put together that we can print that has most of the events on it and we can pencil them in, a few other things, but... Try and get that now that we'll be back. We'll regroup with them. Tonight we're going to um, turn our Bibles first of all, I also want to remember next Sunday morning at uh, next Sunday morning at the um, 10.30 will be our regular service. I didn't mention that. It seemed like there was something else I'm forgetting to announce. The sign-up, there is the sign-up sheet in the uh, entry for the helping out with the snacks. And um, I can't think of the others. All right. We're going to read Matthew chapter 6. Tonight, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be get, begin reading at verse 19, he 
He said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves do break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt where, ne where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings of following you. We thank you, Lord, for your help today. We pray, Lord, you continue to help in this service and you would continue to watch over us and bless this message to our hearts. We ask it in thy name. Amen. We're going to talk to you tonight as the Lord shall help us about the comparison of the ways. And in, in Jesus' teachings, he taught us many things. He taught us about the way to heaven. He talked about the contrast of the life of what they had known in the, in the um, society there as they taught the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and their way of laying down the law. And as many times it's been talked about, they built a wall around the Torah, around the law. And they wanted to just box everybody into this law, this way of living that they had conjured up in their ways. In another passage, Jesus talks about the straight gate. For straight is a gate that leads into the kingdom of God. It talks about the wide is a gate that leadeth into destruction. And there's a comparison as Jesus goes through many times. And he compares the way of life with the way of death, the way of heaven with the way of hell. And we want to look at that a little bit tonight. I wanted to have that scripture verse, but I don't have it written down. I don't know what I, why I lost it there, but I did. Um, the promise of the kingdom was the hope of Israel. That's what they had looked for. That's what they had longed for from the time, early days. They had looked for the hope, the, the messianic promise of Israel. And the nation anticipated the coming of Jesus, which they didn't ever acknowledge as him, to set up the kingdom of God, to establish the throne of David. And they weren't expecting him to come as he came. In a manger, simply and humbly, they were looking for a king to take over and to rule over them. But in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. Jesus came in fulfillment of that hope, the messianic hope of the nation of Israel. He came to establish the kingdom of God, to lay the foundation for the kingdom of God. He came to take the dust of the law, the, the, the laws and, the, and the, the, the heart of the gospel that, that they had tried, that God had tried to lay down the law and take it out of the formalism, out of the dust of formalism and bring it to life and show them what it was to really live for God. He came to establish that, to lay the foundation for the kingdom of God, to announce, to enunciate the principles of that kingdom. And as you look at the Sermon on the Mount, where much, much, much of this is found, he found, we find the principles of his kingdom. For not just the Israel, the Israel nation, but for us. What he set forth in that Sermon on the Mount, in the way of scriptural Christianity, was radical to the ears of those that heard him speak. It was different. <clears throat> John came before him preaching repentance, and Harry Plank did a good job of preaching that gospel of repentance when he was here. That's what John came and he, and he preached. Jesus followed preaching repentance, repentance from sin. Not just sorry that we're caught, not just sorry that it's caused us trouble, but repentance. And uh, we, we've mentioned it before, and you know the principle. If, if, I was, if I walk up and I maybe hit somebody, or maybe I even take their wallet, and I, and I walk away with your wallet, and I come back next Sunday, and I said, here's your wallet back. I'm sorry I took it. Will you forgive me? And you said, yeah, I guess. I, you know, I forgive you. But then as you leave this Sunday, I take your wallet again. And next Sunday, the same thing. And you say, well, listen, Pastor Hunter, I don't think you're really sorry. I, I, think, I think you're just sorry you're getting caught, or you feel guilty or something. You're not, you're not stopping what you're doing. And Jesus came to do something in our heart that will help us in that aspect. And as he spoke, he spoke as one having authority, and they felt his power. They felt the power of his words. They felt the truthfulness of what he spoke. They felt the sincerity in which it came from his heart as he spoke to those people. Jesus knew the words he had spoke would conflict with the lust of their sinful heart. 
And he knew because of it there would be many that would not receive what they had been told. You remember a few weeks ago we spoke about that, that those that had a heart change, changed the way they thought of Christ. There was those that didn't like him. There's those that wanted to kill him, but we read in the day of Pentecost, there was those that were saved. There were those that were transformed, and immediately they went from wanting to kill him to wanting to hear more of what he had to say, hearing more of what the disciples had to preach, to hear more about the way of truth. And it was interesting how that change came. And it's an interesting how it will come to your heart as you allow God to do something inside your heart that will change everything about how you feel towards God, towards Christianity, towards church, and the narrow way. In the Sermon on the Mount, he came to the end of his discourse and he drew a contrast of the two ways. He told of a narrow way that leads to the city of God, to life, the narrow way. He had described in the Sermon on the Mount, he told of a broad way. He really wasn't talking about the way of sinners, the way of godless, irreligious that have no interest in the way of God. He was talking about a way that contrasts with the way that he taught. The way proclaimed by false prophets as the way to heaven, a broad, a wide gate that leads to destruction. And in this passage scripture, this description, this, this contrast, he shows us four things we'll look at quickly tonight. There's a contrast in the portals, in the gate, the way of entrance. A contrast in that. In that way we go, be determined by the gate we enter. <clears throat> there's the old, there's the old uh, poem, Two Roads Diverge in the Yellow Wood. Sorry, I could not travel both and yet be one traveler. There comes a choice of the gate of which we'll enter. One, the Bible talks about is pent up. That's what that means, straight. It's not that it's straight like in a row, but it's straight as pent up. It's tight. It's constricted. It, it, there's some restrictions to get in. It's not just wide enough to let everyone pass through. In contrast is the Broadway. It's wide. Just anybody can, you can just, you can just accidentally walk through that without even thinking. You could just make it through. And so that entrance is a contrast in the portals. Not because the way isn't accessible, not because it's not provision has not been made for you to enter, but because it's demanding. <clears throat> not demanding in self-effort or effort that comes from our own striving, but demanding in spiritual love and requirements. He, talked, he taught them of a way that was harder. Why? Because it was something that they could not do. The law allowed them to do some things. They could follow the law. They could read the law, one, two, three, four, five, six, and they could follow that, and they could check it off. Well, I've, I, I've, I've not eaten with unwashing hands, and, and I've not picked corn on the Sabbath day, and I've done this, and I've done that. But Jesus taught them a different way, a way of truth, a way of heart holiness, a way that transformed their life from the inside, a way of love. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's different than what they had ever heard. And that straight gate, he showed us why. It was conviction of sin, contrition of heart, so full submission to God in every aspect of life. He began this discourse with three words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He was speaking of those who have, who have come to see their true spiritual need. Those that enter in that straight gate will be those that came to see themselves as, as desperate in need of Christ, in need of something different than they've tried. Something like the many that he touched that tried many, many things, like the lady with the issue of blood, have tried many things but grew worse rather than better until she found Jesus. And many have tried reform. They've tried society's um, programs, and they've tried many things. But when we truly find Jesus Christ and allow him to change us from the inside out, we will find that entrance, that portal that he's talking about. In Romans 7, Paul describes for us the awakening of his own heart. When he came to awareness, the true spiritual state he possessed, he said, when I, the commandment came, thou shalt not covet, he said, I saw it demanded of something in me I was not able to give, outwardly blameless as far as the, uh, regarding the law. Keeping the traditions of the fathers, there was something different that was, that was brought there when he was come face to face with that. It was something different. Thou shalt not cover. He discovered down in his heart was a fountain of evil passion and evil desire that he was not aware of. And the commandment came and sin reared his head in opposition to that commandment of God. And became, he became aware as he had not ever been aware before of his utter helplessness before it. 
Not just to fulfill something written on a piece of paper, not something found in a scroll, but something deep within his heart that only God can do for him and he could not do for himself. And he came to this conclusion, that is in me and my flesh dwells no good thing. What a rude awakening for him. What a terrible place to find himself, to find ourselves, to come to recognize that we are absolutely bankrupt spiritually. I have absolutely nothing to commend me before God. I'm guilty and helpless unless someone comes and delivers me. And that's where we need to get before God can help us. And as I go on in life and work with individuals and even outside of this church and my history of working with it, I've realized more and more that we need that, that slow take us back until we realize just how depraved we are as we face that portal. Some have wrapped themselves in their spiritual righteousness and are completely unaware of the deep spiritual need of their life. Paul was. Paul had thought he was doing God's work. He thought he was doing everything right, completely unaware of his deep spiritual need. And sometimes God awakes us directly, sometimes through loving people, sometimes through the preaching of the word. But God will bring us to face ourselves as he did Paul. But it's a rude awakening that I'm guilty and helpless. Blessed are the poor in spirit. If we're going to enter the way of life, we're going to have to enter by the way of conviction of sin. And come to recognize that. Meekness. He talks about meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is the absence of that spirit that fights against God. That acts in resistance and rebellion against God. To get into the straight gate, to get into that straight portal. I want to suggest to you, I want to tell you this evening, you'll have to come by the way of conviction, by the way of contrition of heart, brokenness of heart, submission to the will of God, to where we no longer debate the issues, no longer argue with God. Whatever it requires, I'm not fighting my own way. I'm not contending for what I want. I just come surrendering. I'll do what you want me to do. The narrow gate, this straight gate, demands contrition. We read, if I... Over in Matthew chapter 5, we read, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It requires a radical separation from sin. He's not teaching self-mutilation here, and neither are we suggesting that. But there is some, if there's some sin or some sinful need in our heart, some reoccurring issue in our life, something that's as dear to us as our right hand, we're going to have to cast it off. We're going to have to get radical in our separation from sin. There's those that have gone on all their, all their life long and fighting the same things in life. What's wrong? They've never gotten radical in their separation from it. They're convinced it's wrong. They're convinced it's sin, but they haven't become radical in separating from it. And he's telling us it need to get radical. I don't believe he literally is telling them, cast it off, cut it off to, to get yourself to get victory over it, but be that radical in our separation and our seeking for deliverance from it before God. And not wanting to hold on those things. If we're gonna, if we're gonna pass through that narrow way, if we're gonna pass through that narrow portal, we're gonna have to be that radical in our lives and dealing with those things. Jesus says it in red, written in Matthew. He says, "For one, it's that serious that it'd be profitable for us to have that happen, and for our body, for one of to lose part of what we are, part of ourself, part of whatever that is, we're not willing to give up." and enter into life, into heaven, than to go to hell with everything intact. The straight gate requires the abandonment of the love of the world and turning the affections towards God. Lay not up, as we mentioned, treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. And rust doth corrupt. Talking about layers, we're going to have to transfer our affections. We're going to have to make a transfer from the love, our affections, that thing that's deep in our heart, from the things of this world to the things that focus on God. Until it becomes our chief objective, our chief desire, our chief pursuit. Everything else may become second. You begin to love him. You put your affection on him rather than the things of the world. Instead of following the principles of the world, you begin to follow the principles of the word. You begin to live in the word of God. Walk in harmony in the word. Instead of being time-focused 
And having time-focused goals, we begin to look at eternity and live for things that are eternal. I think it was last Sunday night we mentioned it's so easy to get wrapped up in today. Everything looks so big today. Everything looks so big this week. But in the light of eternity, our life is just so short. And we've got to get our focus off of now and what pleases me and my body now, what pleases my mind and my soul now, than what pleases God and what's going to last for eternity. Eternal investments. I want to tell you, we're not living for the presence. We're living for where we're going to be 100 years from now. Every one of us, 100 years from now, will not be on this earth. I can guarantee, just about guarantee it. And that's what we should be living for. That's what Christ is trying to teach them. That's what he came. That's what he spent all of his life. That's what he gave himself for, is to wake us up that this is not about us. It's not about this moment. It's not about these 70, 80, 90, 105 years, but about eternity. If we're going to enter the straight gate, we'll have to give up the love of the world, to focus all of our faculties on the eternal. It demands a possession of true righteousness with God and man. For I say unto you, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Theirs was a self-righteousness. It was a righteousness of their own making. It was an outward righteousness that consisted of the dress that they wore, the rules that they kept, but had nothing to do with their heart. Jesus said, you'll have to possess a righteousness that comes from God. A righteousness is a product of God's making. Through his shed blood on Calvary's lamb, and you'll have to come to help us, come help us before him by simple faith of what Jesus did on Calvary and receive a righteousness that he has provided for you that will only happen as we come to God in this contrition, this melting, this brokenness. We must also possess a righteousness with our fellow man. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, remember that thy brother has ought against thee. Leave therefore thy gift, and go thy way. First be reconciled thy brother. Then come offer thy gift. He talks about restitution. He talks about making things right. You don't hear a lot about that, but we used to hear a lot about it, and I still believe in it, that if we stole something, we need to bring it back. If we've said something, we need to make it right to the best of our ability. I remember stories of Preachers that I grew up under, my waist great grandpa used to tell of a man had a log chain that was stolen, and the man brought it back. He got saved, got did some praying, and he brought the log chain back. And I don't remember. I think it started out. The guy dropped it off at the end of the gate there, and the man the man saw it come back, and he said, "Log chain, you're back, but you're not home yet." And that bothered that man. That man finally had to go pick it up and carry it all the way up to the porch. He left it up there. And he went out and saw it laying on the porch. He says, you're almost home, but you're not home yet. And then finally that man went and picked it up. He just couldn't get clear of that conscience. And he went and confessed that he had stole his chain and was bringing it back. And there he was free. What a freedom that gives. Repentance and, and restitution is hard. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever do, but it's one of the most rewarding. It's a freeing. It's a lifting. It takes away that weight, that guilt from within. It makes us right with our fellow man. If we have, if we come to the altar and pray, God, God will take us on credit, I believe. I believe God will do a work in our heart, but he's going to put things on our mind. He's going to put things, and sometimes there's a trail that we have to go, and the older we are, it's a bigger trail to go back and harder but when that's done, there's a witness that comes and says, son, I'm well pleased in what you've done. And society will know it. I remember the one story of a man that was, uh, he, had, he had owed quite a bill. I think it, I think it the, might have been at the local bar. And that man got saved. Not only did he quit going to the bar, but he went and paid his bill. And that, that bartender went to the preacher and he said, is this what your church teaches and believes? And he was pretty excited about that. He thought they all ought to get saved. And maybe he'd get all his money. But it'll take back the stolen things. I had one man I worked with. He was, went to my church, and God was working in his heart. He was changing some things. You could tell God was speaking to him. And he came to me one day, and he said, Preacher, he said, when I was in the Navy, he said, I stole some things, some, some fittings, stainless steel fittings. And he said, I, I took them home in my bag, and I have a lot of them. He did. And he said, God's been dealing with me, and I feel like I need to send them back. He said, but I'm just going to put them in a box and mail them anonymously, he said, because if the government finds out I stole all of them, I'm going to be in jail. Well, he was old, retired. 
I didn't feel like they'd probably be too hard on him if he put a note in there and told him that, told him the story that, you know, he's old, he was young, now he's old, and he's retired, and, and God's speaking to him, and he's just trying to do the best he knows to do, and he didn't know better. And, but he just felt, and I said this to him, I said, you know, it's just as close to heaven from your house as it is from a jail cell. And that's a hard thing, and I to this day don't know what he did. I've never followed up and asked him, but that's truth. I remember our bishop of our last church talked to a man, and, and that man had committed murder. And he said, he said to him, he said, Preacher, he said, if I do what you're telling me to do, I'm going to have to confess murder. And he told him that. He says, just as close from a prison cell to heaven as it is from here, but you won't make it to heaven with unconfessed sin. That's a hard thing, and God will have to work in our hearts, but it's a necessary thing. Leave therefore thy gift at the altar, go thy way, be first reconciled thy brother, and then come offer thy gift. Take back the stolen things, go to those you've injured with your tongue, humble yourself, acknowledge your big mouth if you have to, unholy tongue. In contrast to the straight gate, there stands a wide gate. I'm just going to back up quick. You know, I had one, mess, one preacher, one, one man come to me at the last, last place I preached, and he had gotten saved, and he said, Preacher, he says, you know, I didn't like you. I didn't like your preaching at first. He said, but I've come, he said, I've come to realize you were right. You were preaching the word to me. He said, but I've run your name out around this town. I've talked ill about you. And he says, I have no way to know who all to tell. I think I mentioned that a few weeks ago about the feathers, right? Caught in the wind, where the tail goes. When we talk, when our mouth runs, we have no way of knowing where those feathers go. I said, you, I said, I forgive you. You could just do your best to be away. And he did. I believe he did. He went around, tried to make things right the best he could. But be careful what we say. We can never get it back. Wide is the gate, broad is the way, leads to destruction. Few restrictions, few demands. I'm hurrying here. It allows entrance with a nominal claim to his lordship. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Is that really in there? You'd think today that anybody had just said the name of Jesus is, is a Christian anymore. You just stick the sticker on him. But God doesn't teach that. He doesn't teach it's that easy. He said, not every one that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of heaven. Of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, I haven't we prophesied in thy name? In thy name have we not cast out devils? In thy name done many wonderful works, and he will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Jesus said, He that cometh of any other way is a thief and a robber. Why is he telling us that? Because there's one way, there's one portal, there's one opening, there's one, there's one door, and that's through Jesus Christ, and that's through repentance and contrition and confession and forsaking of sin. And that's the only way. If we try and bypass that and go any other way, you can go around that. You can go. Everything else is considered the broad way. But he said, I'm going to confess to you. I never knew you. You never came through the door. You never came through the right way. You can see the why <clears throat> Jesus is speaking here of people who claim lordship but who do not submit to the rule of his lordship. You see, you can get in the wide gate. It doesn't make any demand of those who will enter. It doesn't demand contrition of heart. It doesn't demand brokenness of spirit. It doesn't demand obedience to the will of God. Lord, Lord, and you can enter. It doesn't demand crucifixion of the passions of our heart but allows entrance when external reformation only that is superficial. You has heard, heard of them that of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But whomsoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. You see, the philosophy was, the thinking was the commandment, thou shalt not kill. So as long as I don't take anybody's life, as long as everybody's heart still keeps beating, I'm okay. But Jesus narrowed it down. He got into the heart and said, if you, hate, if you have ill will, if you hate someone enough to wish they were dead, you're guilty. He goes on in other ways. If you, he said before, if you commit adultery, if, you, if you're caught in the act and you're guilty of sin. But Jesus said, I say unto you, that he that, look at that a woman, even in their heart, you lost. You're guilty of adultery. Not just in the act. So he brings it down closer. He brings it down to reality. He takes it down into life. 
You can get in the wide gate by conformity to the letter, but you're, if you're going to enter the straight gate, it's going to demand something more of your heart. You see, you can enter the broad way by observing the letter where the lusts of your heart go on unchecked. The passions of the heart can vent themselves occasionally. It makes no demand that we be crucified. You can get in the wide gate without that. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Never let Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He knew what it was. It allows friendship with a profession of grace. For where your treasure is, there is your heart also. For the light of the bo- if the light of the body is the eye, therefore thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness. How great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You see, he's talking to people who are trying to hold on to God with one hand and the world with the other, and you can't get in that straight gate that way. Secondly, a contrast of the paths. And we hurry. Beyond the gate lies a way. The character of the way is marked by the portal. Beyond the straight gate is a narrow way. It's the way of godliness. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. For those who walk the narrow way, God is preeminent in the aims and goals in their life. They are selfless in their pursuits. They are interested in God's way and desires rather than their own. It doesn't matter what he requires. First is to please him. And to be in subjection to him, his authority, to his word. Jesus wasn't interested in being popular. He wasn't interested in fitting in. But he was interested in that one thing, the spirit of God that came from time to time and settled down and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It doesn't matter what was required. It didn't matter. He didn't have house or place to lay his head. It didn't matter. The cross lay at the end of his journey. But he had a single eye to the glory of God. The way of godliness after this manner therefore pray our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven is that our will tonight god's will that that his will is being done in our life as it's being done right now in heaven when god asks for something in heaven do you think there's a question do you think there's a longing do you think there's a there's an argument father we pray that many times thy kingdom come thy will be done in my heart, as it is being done in heaven. That'll change the way we live. That'll change the way we act. That'll change the way we interact. Take heed, you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father, which is in heaven. It's a way of obedience. Therefore, I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, so all be fulfilled. Obedience to God's commands. Whosoever shall break one of the least commandments and teach men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great. We're living in a day of carelessness. But those on the narrow way are interested in God's way and God's commands, a way of carefulness, obedience, of a way of faith, confidence in the midst of darkness, in the, in the midst of spiritual pressures, in the midst of opposition. It's a way of confidence. Your heavenly Father knows what you have need of. It's a way of forgiveness. We talked about that. Refusal to hold a grudge. We talked about that this morning. No, he didn't say nobody would mistreat you. He said, blessed are ye when persecuted. Expected, he said. Blessed are you when, when you were persecuted for righteousness sake for years of the kingdom of heaven. But in the heart of those who walk this way, there's a disposition of forgiveness. He that will not forgive breaks the bridge over which he himself must cross if he'll ever reach heaven. For everyone hath need of forgiveness. George Herbert said that. Yea, though for those who intentionally and selfishly injure us, with malice seek to harm us, there's a lot of unforgiveness, a lot of grudges. In the narrow way, there's a spirit of forgiveness, a way of perfectness. Some stumble over that. He says in Matthew 5, 48, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Straight is the way, narrow is the way. You see, as you get into the way, you don't have a perfect understanding of all that God wants. But as we walk in the light, God will increase the light that he gives us. As we can handle it, as we can understand, he will cre- and he'll work us, and he'll perfect that which he has begun in our lives. 
The narrower it gets, the better fellowship with him that he has. He wants to work with us. He wants to, he wants to perfect understanding. He wants to perfect our, our, our acknowledgement of him, our relationship with him. All those things he wants to work in our heart. It's a way of godliness. After this manner, therefore pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Straight is the way. We don't need to have a perfect understanding of all that God wants, but as you walk in the light, God will increase it. The narrow it gets, the better fellowship. And as you walk in the narrow way, you'll come to a place where you recognize that there are things in our heart that God wants to deal with. You see, that's perfecting of what God has done. A way of assurance. The light of the body, if the Matthew 6, 22, the light of the body is the eye, therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. The narrow way is full of light and assurance. Allows God to work in us until our light is single, our heart and heart full of the love of God. To the light of his presence, the assurance of his approval is worth more than all the world. Thank God for the assurance of the narrow road if we press through and walk on the narrow way. The path is just as shining light that shineth more and more until the perfect day, the word assures us. In contrast, the way that lies beyond is a wide gate. Wide is a gate, broad is a way that leadeth to death. The wide gate leads to a way that is equally broad and unrestricted, far less demanding as the broad way was less stringent, so is the path. But it's a way of presumption. He says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, it's a way of presumption. They're presuming that they're on the right way, but in, in reality, they have not come through the portal God has required. <clears throat> There's assumption they belong to him when they really don't. He said, I never knew you. There's a lot of walking this way because of their assumption. They spend time in prayer. They may read their Bible, go to church. They're assuming because they've taken themselves certain practices, they belong to him, but it's false. We've heard the saying that we're no more a Christian because we go to the church than we're a car because we sit in the garage. There's something that has to be changed in our heart that makes us Christ-like. We can't do it by our own willpower. We can't do it by our own acknowledgement. We can't do anything but by confessing our sins and forsaking them, allowing Jesus Christ to wash us with his blood. If his nature has not been stamped on our heart, if we have not come by the way he has laid out, it's a way of presumption. The followers of the Broadway vainly impute to themselves the name of God and righteousness of Christ, presuming themselves to be, but without the seal of divine assurance, the broad way is a lay of license. Jesus said, Ye that work iniquity, ye that work lawlessness, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets, I am come to, not to come to destroy, but to fulfill. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, not one jot nor tittle shall pass, and no wise pass from the law, to all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, whosoever therefore, he said, shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so. What does he mean by least in the kingdom of heaven? You remember the prophet said to Israel, them that honor me, them will I honor, but those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. That doesn't mean they're in the kingdom of heaven. It means the kingdom of heaven, they're lightly esteemed. They're not keeping the commandments of God. They're not walking in a court of righteousness. They're not walking in obedience to the will of God. It's a way of license. It makes loopholes for the expressions of their heart. And if you study the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus puts his finger on the loopholes they made. The loopholes in thou shalt not kill, thou sh loopholes in thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not committed adultery, and he was putting loopholes where they had made loopholes that God had never intended there to be from the beginning. But in their civil law, and their counsel, he said, as they had made loopholes for expressions of their carnal heart, ways of human approbation, glory of men rather than of God, they derive their ethical standards from the crowd rather than God's word. They're in harmony with the church around them, but not with God above them. The way of worldliness. Lay up for yourselves treasures. Lay not for yourselves treasure upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt. 
rust doth corrupt, and wherefore where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. No man can serve two masters. That broad way is a way of destruction and darkness. The light of the body is the eye. If thy light eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. Supposing they are on the way to heaven, only be deceived. Then there's a contrast of popularity. Because narrow, the gate is narrow, because it depends on not so much on self-exercise as in self-surrender. Not so much of exalting self, but abasing self. It goes against the grain of the carnal heart, dying to itself and it's demanding. Few there be that find it. Few there are that are willing to go to Calvary. If any man will, few there be. The Broadway is popular. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord. Many shall say, Lord, I had this great ministry. Lord, I had this great following. All these great works, Lord. All the money I've given, all the... Many, he said, the popularity of that way. You remember in the Old Testament, Ahab was wanting to war with Jehoshaphat. He came down to inquire of him. He said, my people is your people. My horses are your horses. Let's inquire of the Lord first. So Ahab gathered his prophets together, 400 men. And then the king of Israel, he says in 1 Kings 22, 6, he said, the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400, and said unto them, shall I go against Ramoth Gilead and the battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver in thy hand. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said to him, There is yet one man, Micah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire. But listen here, he said, I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Oh, let not the king say so. And then down in the 13th verse, the 22nd chapter, he said, The message that was gone to Micah spake unto him, Behold, now the word of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like unto the word of those, and speak that which is good. So he says, Listen, everybody else already told us this is going to turn out great. And, and just agree with them, won't you, preacher? Just agree with everybody else. And you already heard what he said. They said, Oh, everything's going to be good in the beginning. 20, in the 22nd chapter of 1 Kings, the 6th verse, he said, Shall, Oh, yeah, he said, it's going to be great. It's going to go, it's wonderful. And then he said, he just had that feeling that something wasn't right. And I've, I've had people come to me. I've had people come to our church said, you know, I've had people tell me I'm okay living the way I'm living, but when I read the Word of God, it just doesn't feel right. What do you think, preacher? And I tell them the truth, and sometimes they go, well, let's find another opinion somewhere. But here in the king, this message that came, he said, they said to him, now listen, they, they, wanted, they wanted to preface this with what someone else already said. Now listen, he said it's going to be okay. Can you just agree with him? But this other man said, he's not, you know, this prophet, that preacher down the road, he, I hate him. He doesn't agree with anything. The message that was gone to call Micah spake unto him, behold, now the words of the prophets declare good. Micah, listen, Micah, however you say his name. Behold, now the words of the prophets, they declare good with one mouth. Let your word also be like unto the word of them. He said, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Thank God for preachers that aren't afraid to preach truth. Thank the Lord for those that are willing to go against everybody else. See, broad is the way, wide, many people. There's a huge following that's going to go that way. But he said, straight or narrow, few there be that go in of the way of true repentance. And Micah said, listen, I could care less. My eyes are shut to the crowd. My ear is open to God and him only. And what God tells me, I'm going to tell you good or bad. So he said there in the 17th verse, he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return into his house in peace. And the king of Israel said, did I not tell you he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? See, I told you that preacher has nothing good to say about me. 
And I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And he said on the manner, And there came forth the Spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I'll go forth and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. And I will persuade him. That should wake us up to the danger of what lies beyond what we can see or understand. The spirit world out there that's deceiving the broad, those on the broad way. You see here he spoke with animation and inspiration. It was not of themselves. It was an inspiration that was supernatural in character, but it was not divine. It was supernatural and inspiration, but it was demonic. Many there be that go in there at. See, he wanted to listen to one that would agree with him and agree with the crowd. It's okay to live like you want. It's okay to go where you want. It's okay to, to act like you want and to speak what you want and think what you want. But the Bible says, no, there's a way that's right. There's a way that's, that, that's different. It's a, it's a way of contrition. It's a way of humbling. It's a way of the cross. You can go to the false prophets, you can go to anywhere, and they'll tell you you can do anything. You can go about anywhere in this day and age and get someone to tell you you're okay doing anything. But the Bible has laid out things that are right and things that are wrong. And thank God for some that are willing to tell us that. Just read that story in 1 Kings chapter 22, and it should wake us up. There's a contrast in the prospect. Where do they lead? What's the future? I hurry in closing. I know we're going late. Jesus said, straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. Leads to life. Who can comprehend what's involved in that word life? The older I get, the more exciting that is. Can we understand what that means? It leads to life. Who can comprehend that? Life as God intended. Life in the everlasting kingdom. Life without opposition. Life without demons and devils opposing us. Life without worrying about our children going the wrong way. Life without loved ones breaking our hearts. Life without disappointments and trials and tests. Life without physical infirmities. Life as God had originally intended it with Adam and Eve in the garden before sin. Life without sin. Life on the narrow way. Life everlasting in the very presence of God. If only we can get but a glimpse in our heart, it would make this way worth it. We would do everything we possibly can. As, the, as Jesus gave that example, he said, a, a man that looketh for that treasure, he sells all that he hath and purchase that field. If we can get understanding what life is beyond this life, if we can understand what that is and what that would feel like and what it's going to feel like when we stand in the presence of Jesus and know that all the world and sin and hell is behind us and life with him is forever in front of us, we would sell all we have for that field. Whatever restitution we had to make, whatever sin we had to break with, we would do everything we can. That's why Jesus said we need to be radical about this because we do not have a right comprehension of what life will be beyond the grave. Destruction. The end of, the end of, broad, of Broadway is destruction. That is annihilation. It's destruction. If I was to take my phone and just smash it out on the pavement, run it over, that's destruction. Little pieces. Take a plate and shatter it. That's destruction. That's not annihilation. What is destruction? It's the human vessel, the soul of man, intended by our Creator to be the dwelling place of God, molded in His likeness, radiating the beauty of his holiness throughout the seedless age of eternity, but marred and twisted so by sin destroyed that it can never be returned to what God intended to be. Can I tell you those who walk the broad way are on their road to destruction, on a way to a place of under abandonment by God for sin in their heart. They have chosen never again to have an opportunity to find the blood to cleanse their heart from that inner depravity where you'll never have an opportunity to be remolded in his image, to be restored in his likeness, to be cast out on the trash heap of eternity, marred and destroyed by sin. They have chosen to suffer the consequences of their choice. Jesus likened it unto a wise man to build his house upon the sand. You know that story. I'm not going to read it. You see, that house was made for shelter, security in the storm. And it 
needed to stand steadfast. Firm through the winds, the floods provided shelter for which was built. But in contrast, those that see the straight gate and turn away from the broad is like a man who built the hand on the, that that go into the broad way is like those who built on the sand. When the floods came and the wind, we ought to know the story, it failed. That house that was built for a purpose, that built, was built for shelter, security, in time of storm, it failed. No hope of ever being changed in his likeness. Just like we cannot fathom what life is going to be like, we're not going to be able to fathom really in this world what death is going to be like, eternal, eternal separation from God. Jesus may gives us a choice. It's not set. We're not predetermined. His response is predetermined. He said, whosoever will may drink of the life freely. Whosoever will come to him. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever will may not, should not perish, but have everlasting life. I thank God for that promise, that if we will, if we will set our will and we set our will in motion to walk through that straight gate, that portal, into life. All of heaven will be behind us, and there is not a demon or person upside this earth that can stop our will. Whosoever will may come. Two ways, two portals, two dimensions. It's our choice this evening. Let's stand together in closing. We're just going to tarry for a minute tonight. We felt this on our heart. I knew there's not a lot out tonight. Maybe a little different service, but I couldn't get away from it. I wonder if anybody has a need and wants to pray tonight. The altar's always open here. Jesus wants to see us make it. He's done everything he can, and if we turn our will his way, he'll turn all of his powers to help us onto heaven. Heavenly Father, we've done our best to deliver the message you laid upon our heart tonight. We pray, Lord, you challenge us, even those of us, if we've gone on this narrow way, challenge our hearts that we understand where we are on this path. Help us, Lord, to glorify you in our body, our will, to keep checking ourselves, our spiritual pulse, as it were, that our hearts need, but need not be turned from what we've committed to go. We trust, Lord, you dismiss us from the service, not from thy presence. Help us on Thursday, we pray, as we enter in the Bible study of the children. Those that are missing, we trust, Lord, you'll watch over our flock and be with each one during the week. We ask it in thy name. Amen. You may be dismissed.